Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. As load shedding intensifies, energy experts are weighing in on how this long-standing problem could be solved over a period of two years. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss some of the proposals. Hi Terence. Hi Simone. First, there are warnings that load shedding could be far worse if urgent action isn't taken. That's correct. We've already seen this year how intense the load shedding has been uh, during the first half of this year. Eskom's really been struggling and there's been a lot of days where it's been at stage four, which is 4,000 uh, megawatts of, of combined cuts rotated around the country. So we know that 2021 is officially our worst ever year for load shedding. About 13% of the hours in the year were affected by power cuts. And we know that 2022 is poised, uh, as I said, to be even worse. And unless we add this additional capacity, Eskom estimates between 4,000 and 6,000 uh, megawatts, and others estimate that probably the gap might be even bigger, uh, we, are, we are just going to continue to go into worse uh, load, load shedding because there's no way we can rely on a recovery in the coal fleet. That has been the sort of plan uh, baked into the integrated resource plan is a recovery in the energy availability factor from the coal fleet going up uh, f from levels of around 60% all the way up to 75%. That's what's baked in. Now we know that's not the case. In fact, the coal fleet is struggling to sustain levels above 55%. And you know, that unless there's new capacity in the grid, uh, there's going to be very little time and space for the maintenance that is needed to recover the coal fleet. So I think to rely on that, and that has been what uh, I think government has been relying on, to rely on both a stabilisation and a recovery, recovery in the coal energy availability factor is really uh, imprudent at this stage. We need to add uh, new capacity, otherwise load shedding, some reports are showing, are going to be by 2026, 10 times worse than what it was in 2021. The most detailed proposal for ending load shedding was presented by Meridian Economics. What do they say? Yeah, Meridian Economics has done a really detailed modelling, both of the load shedding and how it could have been avoided up until now. We know that there was this uh, seven year gap in procurement, uh, mostly because of the previous leader leadership at Eskom said, we don't need any new renewables capacity, the coal fleet can do it, and uh, therefore we must stop procurement of all renewable energy. And we did. <laughs> so for seven years, we didn't buy any new renewable energy capacity. So nothing has really entered the grid until that, that log jam was broken in 2018. And we, we eventually signed the bid window for projects and those are now starting to enter the system. But if we had just been procuring at that sort of 1,000 megawatts a year type pace, we would have had additional five uh, gigawatts of capacity. And the Meridian report shows that actually in 2021 with that, we would have avoided 96% of the load shedding we had, and which was, as I said, the worst year ever. So they've done then look forward. You know, what do we need to do in the next two years to, uh, to end load shedding? And also then, you know, beyond, they looked all the way to 2026. But in the next two years, what could we do to end load shedding? And basically, it's really very much about uh, solar, wind and storage, using a lot of uh, the private sector. So there's the utility scale, the 100 megawatt market, trying to get as much of that on board as possible. Uh, getting rooftop, the, the sub one, one megawatt market, rooftop solar, households and businesses. There could be a lot that comes on there. And then there's the programs that are, that are in play, the bid window five, which we know is, which has been delayed, the risk mitigation project, other than the car power ships, which face still many uh, legal and environmental obstacles to going. So to, to factor those in, I think would be difficult, but get those projects working. So the risk mitigation, not only getting them into the system, the non car power ship one, but also redesigning the, uh, the, the, the way the architecture, which we know has got major faults with it, and really allowing those projects to give us all the energy they can from their wind and their solar rather than curtailing it because they have to dispatch between this 6.30 uh, in the morning and 9 at night uh, profile, which is not really what the system needs. 
So they're having to build, massively overbuild their wind and solar and can only fill their battery so much and therefore curtail some of that energy. So redesign it to allow the battery to, f uh, to take from grid if necessary, but to let that wind and solar into the system. So that's, uh, that would be a major innovation and a major change. Taking away this uh, 100 megawatt cap and allowing it to be up to 1,000 megawatts, whatever people can build. And then as a sort of belt and braces approach, they say, you know, we must expect some of these things not to work out. So there's the, the procurement programs that are in place, the bid window five, six, the risk mitigation, the battery energy storage program, which is coming soon, the Eskom battery storage program. As a belt and braces approach, we could add some additional diesel capacity uh, in the form of open cycle gas generators or uh, into uh, RCE machines and getting those into the system along with additional diesel storage by 2024. And if all those come together, we would basically be able to eliminate load shedding. So they're not looking at reinventing anything other than taking some of the obstacles uh, that are currently in the way to private as well as utility scale generation coming in and then adding a little bit of support through the additional uh, peakers. Others have also made proposals which differ somewhat. Yes, you know, so we've seen uh, Professor Mark Swilling making an in interesting intervention and Clyde Mallinson making an interesting intervention. Mark Swilling too, looking at about 10 gigawatts, similar to Meridian, 10 gigawatts of new capacity uh, in terms of wind and solar and adding storage to that, about six gigawatts of storage, that's large to that, that would, that's how he sees us getting through this. And then uh, Clyde Manson has a different uh, sort of approach where he's saying, look, look at the coal fleet. And if we don't ramp it down at night, there's actually a lot of energy that we can uh, tap into. And we could actually just add a lot of battery storage, mostly through the metropolitan councils and the district municipalities, get them to put in this battery energy storage at pace. It would be unprecedented globally. But he uses the template that we've seen with the Tesla battery that was rolled out in South Australia. And they, they did that in 90 days. And there was a time when uh, there was a view that uh, Elon Musk wouldn't deliver in 100 days. So he said, well, if I don't deliver in 100 days, you don't have to pay me. And he en ended up <laughs> delivering it in 90 days. So he's saying there is a, a template for a rapid rollout of battery storage. And these can be different. They can't, don't just have to be lithium iron. iron. There could be many different types of battery storage options so the, and then using that energy instead of ramping down the coal fleet every night storing it and then injecting it into the system um, when it's needed so there are other proposals but all of them basically are solar wind and storage heavy all seem to agree however that political will and coordination will be key yeah i mean that is that is the the only way uh, that we're going to get out of this uh, mess in the time frame that people are talking about. We can't have a business as usual approach and we have to have massive political will and everyone pointing in the, the same direction and massive amounts of coordination around that. Now there's also differences there as to where the pivot should be for that coordination. Uh, Professor Swilling very much says it should be Eskom that is given the mandate to just drive this program and drive it aggressively and they have the skills, the expertise and we see um, the Meridian uh, economics proposals very much that the pivot should be inside the presidency. And the argument there is that there's just so many moving parts in the public sector that you need alignment around, whether it's around local content from the DTRC, uh, getting registrations and licensing through NERSA, uh, getting the, 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 the architecture working correctly through the DMRE, through, uh, that's the procurement architecture through the DMRE and the IPP office. There's a lot of public sector actors getting the uh, environmental approvals that are needing, that's from DEF. So there are just so many public sector actors other than the private sector actors that need to be coordinated that they feel that, uh, that the presidency is the right place to hold this, uh, this, this sort of a crisis emergency power unit and get everyone pointing in the same directions. But basically, the overarching message is that we need political will and coordination. And whether that's in Eskom, whether that's in the presidency, or whether it's in the DMRE or wherever it is, we need to have that because it can't be 
as we see at the moment, there's very stilted procurement processes, trying to do it business as usual, trying for cherries on the top around local content and around PV panels, when we actually need to get as much electricity into the system as quickly as possible. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.